So let's get started. So welcome everyone to the end day Ocean Innovators uh, AI forum. Um, so the purpose of today is really to discover how can we use artificial intelligence for good and to help us monitor and protect our oceans. Um, so before I get started with the event itself, um, I must I really must acknowledge uh, the people who really uh, made this possible. Um, so first of all, Andrea, who is taking a picture right now. <laughs> uh, um, thank you so much for uh, helping us to uh, organize this event today. Uh, the support of Monash has been extreme uh, in terms of all the, the past three months in, in trying to find the, the right speakers, the right room, and, and the right uh, timing for the event, so thank you for organizing all of this. Uh, and that involved the Faculty of Science, the School of Mathematics, and the National Air Future Institute. Uh, I also have to acknowledge the support of, of AFRAN. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, the Australian French Association for Research and Innovation, uh, AFRAN, uh, has been supporting us, uh, Ocean Innovators, in the past two years in organizing such events all around Australia. Uh, so that's why I'm here in Melbourne today. Um, we did uh, a similar event a couple of uh, weeks ago in Brisbane, um, and we keep uh, organizing events to support more collaboration between researchers and, um, and industry, governments, uh, not for profits, as you may have seen through the videos that you've seen before. Uh, all of this thanks to uh, many sponsors who have been uh, enabling all of this. Uh, but I also have to acknowledge the traditional custodian uh, of the land, the Wamanjari people of the Kulin Nation, uh, past and present. So before we get started, I thought I would take the, the news that I've watched last night. Uh, on my phone, I, I saw this uh, because I thought it would be interesting for, for the event. Um, up to 46% of the jobs in Australia uh, might be replaced by AI by 2030. That means that Australia needs 100,000 people, a digitally skilled worker, in 2024, and we are only training 7,000 students. Uh, so that you're, we need more of you, we need more people to fill out this room. Uh, AI might be complex, and mathematics as well, but we need to train more, more of those students to take those skills in AI. And the result of why we are not doing it uh, enough in Australia is that Australia is falling behind. Uh, but today is not the topic of what we have to do uh, for um, the future of uh, digital jobs uh, and, and the future of Australia. It's the future of our oceans uh, all around the planet. And uh, for this, uh, we are lucky to have uh, three speakers um, which are going to tell us about what the industry is doing um, to, uh, to use uh, AI to help to protect our oceans. And there are many ways to protect the oceans, and we are, I'm hoping we are uncovering some of those ways today, and we will finish with a discussion, same as a discussion we, you've been having all day, on how we can use uh, AI, but this time to protect uh, the ocean and support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So, uh, the three speakers, uh, Jonathan, Jonathan uh, Chang uh, is sitting right here, if you want to wave around the room. Uh, Jonathan is from Silverphone and he's coming today um, to tell us about the use cases and challenges in marine surveying with AI. We've got um, Paul uh, Sherry, uh, Sherry, do I pronounce it properly? Yeah, mm -hmm. beautiful. Uh, from Platypus, um, the technology and potential fleet of USBs. And uh, Paul has already given a talk earlier today, so that's his second talk, so thank you for uh, doing uh, the evening ones as well. Um, and myself, uh, I'm from Ames, um, Ames the Australian Institute of Marine Science. Um, I work in the input systems and in instrumentation domain, and we did, we have three test ranges uh, in on the Great Barrier Reef, and we are deploying a smart technology and testing that technology, generally working with academics and defence and uh, other industries to test their technology on the reef uh, through those test ranges. So. Um, this is my day-to-day -day job. I also have a business for OceanX Group, um, and I'm also a lecturer, as I mentioned earlier in my previous talk. So to get started um, today, I have a very short, uh, oh, very short. I have 
one talk um, about how we came up to the concept of ocean innovators, what we've done. So I'll start with that, and I will introduce what sort of key aspects uh, AI can help us to uh, support for our sustainable development goals for our oceans. Um, so the little story is a little bit more than five years ago. Um, I was invited at the United Nations to um, give a talk uh, about artificial intelligence. And somehow, it looks like my talk was probably a little bit too complicated. Uh, I didn't show that slide in particular, but um, at the end of the talk, people uh, came to tell, to tell me, um, even though I tried to make it as simple as possible, they said we have no understanding on how we can use artificial intelligence to support our United Sustainable Development Goals. And the purpose of that event in Kenya uh, back uh, more than five years ago was to uh, launch the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and, and try to engage with uh, the conversation on what we can do. And people had no clue what we could do with artificial intelligence. So the message didn't go through. Um, so the question that I asked myself is, um, what can we do to actually get the message across that we can use uh, innovative technology to solve the problems? And the, the <coughs> reasoning in the, the, what happened next was quite interesting is, I came up with some testing in Kenya and we looked at um, testing technology and we realized that technology by itself um, didn't solve the problem that we thought it would. Um, we actually came across challenges we would never have expected. So on paper, it looked amazing. In the theory, it looked possible. In reality, it didn't work. And that's one of the challenges that I faced. And there are a couple. Uh, first of all, uh, if we were to uh, try to monitor the human impact on the rivers in Kenya, um, the first thing that I realized is there were crocs in the river, and it was not very safe to send humans um, to actually collect data uh, on the river. So that was the first problem that I fa faced. And the, se the second one is uh, the amount of pay power failure over there was pretty dramatic. Uh, it was unsustainable to have security uh, over there because uh, everything was pretty much unsafe. And anything that we would um, set up, uh, we had the risk of getting all the technology being stolen or, or it was very difficult to actually do testing. Uh, we didn't think about the bioaccumulation over there. Um, we had algal bloom uh, lilies in the area. Um, it was a very unsuitable environment uh, for actually doing uh, testing. And what we thought we would monitor were disturbed by a gigantic amount of water lilies in the river. Uh, we also didn't know that the rivers were actually used as cemeteries, so they were just covered covered with bodies, and it was very unsafe to actually send humans there, uh, even to monitor and try to, uh, to understand, basically build our data sets. So we didn't end up successfully build the data, set, the data sets we thought we would, and it turned out that uh, what is looking good on paper doesn't always work in reality. So that's basically my learning. Uh, and not only the people over there didn't understand what the message that we tried to convey. I came back to Australia a little bit empty-ended, apart from a big trophy they gave me at the United Nations, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what to do with it because behind it, nobody else wanted to continue the conversation. Um, so it was great, um, but the question was, what, what can we do forward? So I stepped back a little bit and I looked at Australia. I looked at Australia and I thought, okay, Australia is a big island, pretty gigantic, there are not many people over there, Automation is a way to go, so uncrewed systems, obviously. Uh, and we are surrounded by islands, and those islands, they have issues. And today we talk about fisheries, issues with fisheries, and how can we protect our coastal waters and our beautiful ocean um, through uh, pole stock. So I'm not gonna go too much into details, but essentially, we've got a pretty interesting area. We are in a place to actually really change the world and, and protect our oceans. We are right at all these good spots, and we are surrounded by dangers and by small island nations. Uh, all those small island, island nations, they need to be protected, they need some support. There is not much funding, and when you look at the, the amount of funding available in terms of GDP, it's pretty dramatic. Uh, this is a map of the world with the G GDP, and this is what we call an anamorphic map. 
which showcase basically that Australia shrinks quite a bit when you look at the size, but every other uh, nation who actually need protection with the ocean, uh, the global south essentially is don't, doesn't have enough funding to actually support our sustainable development goals for our oceans. It's not it's not yet there. Uh, we we have a big responsibility and not enough um, tools to support those uh, challenges. So I came up with the concept of um, during COVID um, to organize uh, an ocean innovators platform online. So the concept was uh, people and innovators like you and I, um, we have all smart ideas, but alone it's a little bit difficult to achieve those ideas. But when we work together, uh, we can actually go much further. Um, and you saw those videos before um, the event, there were a couple of videos, these are where a few of the many innovators we interviewed and to see their view, and some of their view are technological uh, advanced, some of their view are traditional owners' views. When you mix traditional owners with um, a technical solution, uh, you actually have the best shot to actually solve the problem that I told you that I couldn't face just with technology. You have to go back, one step back, to the traditional owners. That's pretty critical, and that's why I started the talk with an acknowledgement of the traditional owners. Um, if you go back to the problem they are facing, the solution they are providing, um, these methods are usually much cheaper than engineering methods which are very expensive. So that's why we've had uh, this platform Ocean Innovators and, and we go, went through the entire world asking for people to tell us what are their solutions. Um, we did videos about mangrove restoration for one year and those videos got pretty famous to the point where we were invited at um, COP26 to display those videos and environmental ministers from seven different countries as well as the president of Rotary International decided to meet to talk about those videos uh, and um, this picture showcased the round table which occurred uh, with the Commonwealth Secretary, Secretary General at COP26 to talk about ocean innovators and how can we do to support those mangroves uh, and the result of that is we had Rotary International to pledge millions of dollars for mangrove restoration around the world. And I was starting to be invited in, in Bermuda to uh, go and, and launch new projects on uh, mangrove restoration. And all of that, this thanks to those traditional owners which came up with their solution and how we could mix with technological solution. Um, so the proof is that if you step back from technology and you look at uh, what traditional owners need and you support them instead of imposing your solution like I tried to impose in Kenya. Um, in Kenya, my uh, solution was taken, they removed the name and they put their name and they, they submitted it and the project got famous as well but not with my name. Uh, so you have to support them, you have to help them uh, achieve their goal and not necessarily impose your goal. That's what I've learned uh, through this Ocean Innovators platform. But then COVID ended and we decided to start doing a tour of Australia. Uh, obviously it was much harder to get sponsors to do that. Luckily uh, Afran uh, stepped in and, and supported us for the past two years in actually um, bringing uh, collaboration between Australians and French and they are French in the public, they are uh, uh, Australian in the public and many, many other nations. And the more the merrier, uh, because if we want to help to achieve those sustainable development goals, we actually need everyone in the room, uh, and we need to increase collaboration. So at the beginning of this talk, you went and you looked at the table over there, and for those who arrived early, thank you for completing those uh, sustainable development goals uh, picking. And I can see that some of the goals here are very important to you. Um, I'm going to read them loud so you can see which one is the most important in the audience. So you pick three goals each, so some of them are more important. The first one which came into mind is uh, goal number 30, that's climate action. So if we want to tackle climate action, that's one of the goals that this audience is the most in interested in. The second goal coming in the second position is goal number 14, lab-bedded water. Um, so that's the goal that we are talking about today. Uh, so 
you picked a good one for me. It's, it leads me to the conversation we are going to talk about today. The third goal we picked is end hunger. Obviously, ending hunger comes into having sustainable fishing, which comes to Paul's talk later into making sure we don't destroy the sustainable resources that we have in the ocean. So this goal is intrinsically linked to goal number 40. Um, goal number six is uh, clean water and sanitation. Um, so that goal is once again linked to the water and that links to the river. So the rivers fall into the ocean. So it's all linked as well. Um, so goal number six is also very important to us. And the final goal which was picked today is gender equality. Achieve, achieving gender equality and empower, please come, empower all women and girls. And that's the fifth goal you picked today. So thank you for picking all those goals. But what I want to do with those goals is to show you in the math how those goals are sitting with one another. Um, you can see that there are four goals which are the pillars of every other goal. Um, that means that if you don't achieve those four goals at the bottom, we are not going to achieve the other. We are not going to achieve any of those 17 sustainable goals uh, on the long term because they are fundamental. So the four goals which are biosphere, biosphere related are goal number 15, uh, so life on land. Goal number 14, life below water. You've got so you elected goal number 14 as one of your uh, primary one today. And the two other ones, climate action and uh, safe drinking water access, was also the one you picked. So you picked three of the most uh, fundamental goals. But what we discovered today is that goal number 14 is the least funded goal of all of them. That means that we are missing out on one of the fundamental goals. So if we fail to achieve goal number 14 by 2030, we will fail to achieve every other goal including goal number five for gender equality because all of this is linked up with one another. So if we want to achieve those goals in the space that we have left, so pretty much five years, five good years, we actually have to focus on the biosphere. So the talk of today is obviously to start talking about goal number 14, the least funded goal. So how can we use mathematics and AI to protect our oceans? Well, there are a lot of things we can do with AI. And I put some ideas that I had based on the conversation that I had today. So I've made that slide just today, just based on what you told me that you think was important to you as mathematicians, uh, as engineers, as scientists. And today you told me that uh, climate change and weather for event forecast were the primary one. Uh, we saw that we all told that um, what was um, the climate change uh, and, and the weather forecast was critical for him if he wanted to uh, help to support fisheries. Uh, we saw today that sea level rise and ocean current modeling, we talked about modeling with some of you, it was one of the uh, main aspects we could um, sort of work with AI and modeling and compare the models that we have with the result that we get with AI. Um, wind farms impact, uh, I was told that uh, Monash has a big program with uh, detecting birds and trying to recognize which type of birds in order to assess um, the impact of birds, of uh, wind farms on birds. So having the ability to detect uh, uh, the impact of wind farms is critical. Uh, building digital twins, that's one, one of the talks today, this morning, the first talk, uh, we talked about digital twin and how we can fill the data gaps and use AI to solve those problems. Uh, later today, we will talk about detecting fish, detecting pests, thanks to Jonathan's talk. And uh, probably the crown of thorns is the first thing which comes to mind that there are many other species that we need to detect, uh, including detecting ghost nets. I mean, we will talk about this as well, so I won't go too long on this. Illegal fishing, from, uh, um, Paul will talk about this today. Uh, noise pollution in the ocean, uh, in the ocean, yeah, uh, is an important one. And um, also be able to survey and control uh, uncrewed vehicles. So all of this today leads us to our speakers. Uh, so without further ado, I'll stop talking, I promise. 
and I will let uh, Jonathan uh, come into the, uh, onto the stage and talk about the use case and challenges in marine surveying with AI. And please everyone give a big round of applause for Jonathan. <laughs> Engineers. <laughs> Engineers? Yeah. <laughs> um, and probably the other question I have is how many people are using tools like ChatGPT every day? Oh, yeah. Everyone. Right. Yeah. Wow. How many people pay for a subscription? All right, I'm the only sucker. accounts. You know, like. AI has, is, is such a broad term and it's developed at an incredible pace over the last 10 years. And um, we went from prototypes and demos to fully blown products like ChatGPT, and that is changing the way we live, work, and play. And during this period of time, the job of surveying and analyzing imagery also went through a number of changes. Um, and Silicon's been working with customers, you know, initially as a consulting firm, supporting these um, surveying and analysis use cases, and we were working with people that would manually analyze and review images, and then they increasingly started to rely on machines to do some of those tasks. They would use the machines to classify things, they would use machines to detect things or track things of interest. Um, and what we're seeing is this change in, I guess, how an organization goes around about seeing or what we would say it's on how we you know, perform perception into the world. Right? There's this shift that's happening as you know, traditionally we would have sent people out to go on and perform that task. We would use their eyes and their brains to act as the perception function of an organization. Now we send machines out there, we send a drone, we have a CCTV camera and an IoT sensor. And once we start laying out that infrastructure, we're now starting to change you know, how organizations see. And the data collection side is starting to happen, and I think what has happened also is this perception or analysis or understanding side, right, has started to shift. And you guys, um, also probably seen the uh, technology evolve over the last decade or so where you know, and I'm sure everyone's seen like the bounding box examples you know from you know, eight or nine years ago going around with dogs and cats and hot dogs um, and now we're starting to see um, these foundation models like ChatGPT uh, start to um, you know, start to approach more increasingly approach a human level of life perception. Um, so this is an example that I just fed into my chat GPT uh, using the GPT vision. And then I basically asked it what type of shark is in this image, right? And then it responded that it is a great reef shark. 
And you know, I'm not a marine biologist, so I went online to double check the answers and come up with like a yeah, it is. Someone, someone in the audience nodded. So, um, but I think with this uh, kind of uh, example, it highlights a few things that um, with ChatGPT, we're starting to arrive at a world where the natural language will probably be the primary uh, touch point with our machines, right? Um, where you will now start to instruct the machine with natural language rather than use a programming language, uh, which is you know, what I've done for most of my career. Or you use a graphical user interface where you might uh, you know, click on buttons or, or put stuff into forms. Um, so we're, we're starting to see this shift where we're going to start to use natural language and it's probably going to change the way we start to analyze the imagery. Um, we're seeing that the quality of the responses improve dramatically. And I think anyone that's been following the machine learning field and following how like, these transformers have improved over the last couple of years is seeing these dramatic improvements as they just train on larger and larger amounts of data. And I think because they're improving, we're, we're going to start to shift um, our trust in, in, in using these particular tools. And I think you know, going back probably almost a year now, people were using ChatGPT or using LLM and said, oh, don't know if I can trust it. You know, it seems to hallucinate a lot and make stuff up. And I think that's starting to shift. And people are using it as a daily driver. Probably you will learn to augment uh, that process to deal with those uh, limitations or the actual more answers are just so much better now that people are just, just going to start trusting and using it. So I think with, with these big trends, um, we're going to start to see more and more of like either these foundation models and these you know, um, AI systems used as part of the surveying process, whether it be just as human augmentation as part of the manual review process, or maybe even as just part of the automated process. Um, but let's have a look at some of the use cases that I am um, kind of mention, I'll, I'll uh, go through these uh, quickly if people have know all about it. Uh, so GhostNets was one of the ones that uh, we had looked at. And they are these kind of discarded, lost, and abandoned fishing nets in the ocean. Uh, they're a part of the mini kind of marine debris that's uh, out there. And they pose a serious threat to marine life. Because uh, they continue to kill uh, long after they've been abandoned. Um, so, and often marine park rangers are engaged to recover these ghost nets uh, once they've been identified. Uh, and a part of the challenge is uh, identifying where they are in the first place. So, my understanding is sometimes they do have like plane patrols up in the north where they will sometimes see these ghost nets and then they, they telephone the, uh, the park ranger and then they'll go out and try and, try and recover them. Um, so we've been seeing some research out there where we're you know, using remote sensing like satellites. So this is an example, research from Cyprus in 2020. Uh, there's been more examples since then of using uh, different satellite imagery. Um, so this one's using uh, Sentinel-2, uh, partly I think because it's free. Uh, it's got a 10 meter resolution. Um, so it's only really suitable for large ghost nets. Um, and there's been research out there that has uh, been using high resolution for like World View 3, 30 centimeters resolution. Uh, so what this is pointing to is people starting to use this kind of remote sensing technology uh, using relatively standard uh, off-the-shelf computer vision algorithms and using it to detect uh, these ghost nets as part of that identification process they will then use uh, to notify people to, to, to recover these stresses. Another example, you know, going from say the sky down to on the ocean, or, or onto the boats, uh, is electronic monitoring. Did you guys cover electronic monitoring today when you're talking about fishing? Public support fisheries? No? 
So uh, electronic monitoring that people aren't aware of is where they've started to put um, cameras and sensors onto fishing vessels uh, to record and monitor their activities. Um, and they're using the CCTV cameras, GPS and hydraulic sensors to track and document the catch um, uh, that these uh, vessels are performing and also to track how they handle the discard of any marine life. Um, primarily the authorities uh, are also interested in threatened, endangered and protected species, so, so test species. Um, because they want to uh, help the fishing industry um, develop sustainable fishing practices. Uh, so the electronic monitoring, uh, you can see here some example, they would record these videos continuously and right now they get sent to the authorities and someone has the lovely job of watching all these video footage. Um, so right now it's in a trial phase, uh, I think uh, across the world, a lot of the fleets across Europe and US, Australia, New Zealand, and others, are fairly small fleets, but they're all starting to scale up their fleets. Uh, I think in part in the anticipation that the uh, processing technology is going to be there to support getting through them all. Um, so I think I've seen like New Zealand discuss going to. 300 boats from flying in the next couple of years. Um, I know Europe is also going to start to go and increase their fleet, I think. Um, probably more than a thousand. So it's just going to be a lot of hours of the year to get through. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think one of the challenges uh, when you're looking at this kind of footage is it's all different scenes, uh, every, every single Fishery probably has a different kind of catch, uh, different kind of um, a part of the ocean that they're probably uh, working in, at probably different depths, uh, so they'll catch different things. And they'll uh, also encounter different threatened and endangered species. So there's this huge variety of huge variants uh, that makes the kind of machine learning challenge uh, reasonably high. It's not as if it was um, an assembly line kind of situation where almost everything that you see is kind of has very low variance, so you can kind of train uh, the model pretty easily. Uh, with such high variance, you probably your long tail of events uh, aren't going to occur very often. How often you're going to come across like a endangered species? And they're probably going to be very rare. Uh, so that this is a it's a rare, but it's also important. So, so it's, uh, how, how are you going to solve <coughs> these challenges? Um, but yeah, there is research out there. Um, the Nature Conservancy has like a training data set out on fishnet.ai. Uh, so they're trying to encourage uh, people to do the research and work on that kind of AI problem domain. Because uh, uh, the need's going to be there. Um, so I guess heading down under the ocean, uh, this is um, this example uh, I've got here is about reef cloud. Uh, people heard of reef cloud? I don't know. I know you have. Like, uh, so for the rest of you, uh, reef cloud is a digital tool developed by the Australian Institute of Marine Science uh, to enhance the monitoring of uh, global reefs. Uh, sorry, to enhance the monitoring of coral reefs uh, across the globe. Um, and they're using AI to extract kind of information from images of coral uh, from places like obviously Australia, but Palau, Fiji, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, and the Maldives. Um, I thank you to DFAT for putting money up behind this, and thank you to Hainswell for building it. Um, uh, it looks like this, uh, where the model is basically trained. Uh, on the points that you see, there, those green dots. That's probably pretty obvious. Um, and it classifies those particular points as different types of coral. Um, they do have and uh, rely on human annotations as part of this process. So when they built this application, 
and looking at how to support both the human annotation process with these points uh, with um, the, uh, the AI doing the classification. I think when I was chatting to the guys at Ames about this, they um, would train the models daily, if I remember correctly, so relatively often. Um, the AI is 80 to 90% accurate and seeing a speed of up to 700 times compared to traditional analysis of columns. Um, so I think this is you know, a reasonably good example of, um, uh, of the workflow as it starts to shift. And I think what we're seeing here is the shift from this traditional human surveying process. It's not fully automated, right? um, but it's in this process of being automated. I think the probably end goal would be taking technologies that I'm sure Vicky's working on and aims to just go and do some survey over the coral reef. And because there's enough confidence over the um, over the algorithm now that you don't even have the human involved. Um, so I guess with these examples that you've seen, um, what is um, the technology that we need to help organizations transition uh, to go from this manual inspections to these fully automated inspections? And where at some point we would call that um, an enterprise perception system. An enterprise perception system is this uh, one place where the data, the people, and the AIs come together to form these perceptual tasks for the organization. And so it's, it's this system that um, people will use to organize the data that gets collected from like, things like the drones or the CCTV cameras. Um, and then it's also the place where you integrate this information with the AIs and with the people. And it's also uh, the place where you can monitor uh, both the environment, which is what the perception task is, but also monitor the process itself. And this system then enables uh, greater visibility and control uh, because um, instead of having this uh, opaque pipeline system, uh, you'll have a system that um, allows you to understand what the environment looks like as well as within the environment. Um, you have a faster operationalization because you now have started to standardize the interactions between the people and the models or the models itself or the data that you're collecting. And because things are starting to become standardized, you can start to increase the scale and frequency. And what we've noticed is that a lot of organizations out there are building what I would call an enterprise perception system. to sell you on an enterprise perception system like Highlighter. But what I'm providing here is a name to a pattern that we're seeing out there. And it's important to have a name for the patterns because it helps us think about how we go about transforming our organizations. Um, and so whether you know, we work outside of Marina as well, um, I just came from a conference in the Tuesday from Forestry, forestry examples where they're doing the same thing, collecting the data from drones, from satellite, you know, it's IoT sensors, CCTV cameras, you know, they're all constructing their own enterprise perception systems, getting people to look at the data, getting AIs to look at the data, and to then take, you know, generate insights and test matches. And, and Marine is also going to go through this transition as well. And so maybe give, you know, one kind of deep dive example. Um, we work with the Australian Institute of Science and broad surveying. And broad surveying is uh, beta and remote underwater videos where they have two cameras like you see there. Uh, usually I think they use GoPro cameras and they use those two cameras uh, to record and observe the kind of species that are out there. They have a bait um, which is there uh, to um, attract fish and as the fish comes they get a recording of it 
um, and they use kind of like the two cameras to also do measurements um, of the fish. And a person, a marine biologist, would take about two to four hours to process one hour video. And I believe Ains is doing the order of like a couple thousand plus hours of video per hour, and obviously they want to scale that up. Um, so, um, what we, you know, when we work with them, we're thinking about, well, how do you, you know, yes, we're going to build the AIs uh, uh, as well, but how do you go about transforming that process? How do you go about transforming that supply process? And as you see here, we started to have this workflow uh, that goes from the data that's collected, the data source, to running the models, to people uh, doing the initial assessment of, uh, of the videos, to Sorry, QI stuff. And so what that um, does is starts to allow the organization to formalize this process and to start getting people and AIs to work together to complete this task, conceptual task with the organization. And so we can then plug in AI. So this is like our models that we plug together in a pipeline, in a system, and we have this ability to detect fish, uh, classify each detection of Doing some tracking in the video, and then the output goes you know, back into the system for uh, people to view. And they view it in the, this kind of following tool uh, that you see here. Let's play. Um, uh, this is kind of what they would see in the tool once the, the models uh, have been applied to it in that platform that you saw before. Um, and they can kind of add additional information, or uh, if the system doesn't know what species it is, uh, the marine biologists can add the kind of species they need to it. And so over time, uh, as the organization collects more data in this structured way, they can then train new models, go back to the workflow that you've seen before, the pipeline you've seen before, we are going to deploy the new models, deploy it back into the process uh, that they, they run. Um, so hopefully that gives you um, just a quick overview of like how um, uh, organizations are starting to transition the way they do the survey, how they start to bring together the people that come from the experience of a person and the AI models, how they start to develop these processes around it. Um, I guess that's it. I think so we'll do, do Q&A Q Q Q after, right? Yeah. But I do need you for last maybe picture here. Um, so do you know how difficult it is to find a company who is doing AI for the ocean? Really? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty difficult to find. And actually, it's even more difficult to find a bottle of wine with a scuba diver and a red barrel. <laughs> <laughs> and I did find it, so we well, did do a picture. Of <laughs> so, I don't think I'll find any other <laughs> that will last. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker, Paul. So Paul is going to talk about uh, flexible autonomous coordination of UX, UXBs uh, in the maritime domain. So Paul, your pointer is here. And please be good. Give a big round of applause for Paul. You might have noticed I've shaved since that uh, photo got taken a couple of